one of the favorite teachers of the residency, has won numerous teaching awards. He did his medical school at the West Virginia University, followed by residency at McGill, and then did his neuro-ophthalmology fellowship at the University of Michigan under the supervision of Drs. Trobe and Kornblath. As I mentioned, he is one of our residents' favorite teachers. He has won numerous teaching awards over his time with us here in Toronto, and uh, always look forward to his rounds. They're very entertaining and lots of learning. So thank you, Dr. Margolin and team. Thanks so much, John, for this really overdone introduction. Thank you. I'm just going to share my screen with you guys. I'm going to do a little prelude, but really the stars of the show today will be Michael Nguyen, Seema Imani, and Laura Donaldson. So I'm going to literally take a second here. So just a little prelude to our, to our grand rounds. Uh, awareness of the movement called The Power of Now has transformed the lives of thousands of people in recent years. And the idea behind this movement really boils down to a very one principle, which is importance of being fully engaged in the present moment instead of dwelling in the past or worrying about the future. And as you know, this concept has been around for a long time. That's this famous expression that you have to stop and smell the roses. So when you do stop and smell the rose while practicing meditations, you will take in the flower itself, its stem with the thorns and many leaves. And you'll also pay attention to the place where the rose is growing, the soil, the air, and the plants growing around the rose. Of course, the most important part of the fl flower or the rose flower is the flower itself. And at the base of the flower is the structure a variable called the bud or the hip. And uh, then the nutrients are brought to the flower by the stem, which draws them from the roots, which absorb them from the soil. And uh, last time I stopped to smell the rose, I couldn't stop to notice that it really resembles some, it really has a remarkable similarity to an eye. So look here, the flower is the globe, the bud is the optic nerve head, and the stem is the retrobulbar portion of the nerve. So today we'll present you three cases, all of them cases of giant cell arteritis. So there's no diagnostic dilemma there in any of the cases. Um, all of the cases will be highlighting the mechanism of visual loss in patients with giant cell arteritis. So again, the purpose of our rounds today will be to highlight the mechanism of visual loss in patients with giant cell arteritis. And as the cases are presented to you, please think about the rows, think about the bud, the stem and the air around it when you listen to the case presentations and we will regroup at the end. And without further ado, um, I'll introduce to you Michael Nguyen. Michael, can you? Perfect. Perfect. Good morning, everyone. My name is Michael Nguyen. I'm one of the PGY3 residents. And uh, today I'll be talking to you about a white powdered donut with a red tart cherry. And if that sounds yummy to you, then I encourage you to continue to make yourself a nice breakfast while listening along. I find that's definitely one of the perks of having these virtual grand rounds on Zoom. We'll jump right into the case though. Uh, I have for you an 82 year old gentleman who was referred from the eMERGE for bilateral vision loss. He has been having a weak history of a left eye blob, a gray blob in the center of his vision he says he can see around it, but definitely not through the middle of it. He decided to not seek any medical attention because of COVID and he was worried about going into the emergency room. However, two days ago in his other eye, the right eye, he started developing uh, transient gray curtains that eventually became black. So now he can't see out of the right eye either. On your detailed review of systems, you were able to elicit that he's had four weeks of left temporal headache and left jaw claudication. And you were also able to uh, find out that he's lost 15 pounds in the same amount of time. His past ocular history was unremarkable and his past medical history had the usual vascular suspects with the appropriate medications for those. On examination, you see that he is hand motion in the right eye and had bare counting fingers in the left eye. And on a pupillary examination, you were able to see that he had a right RAPD. The pressure was normal and the anterior segment examination was also within normal limits. Looking now at his fundus photographs, we can see here the right and left fundus photographs. 
and looking at the right eye, the first thing you'll notice is that your attention is immediately drawn to the optic nerve, which looks very pale and very swollen. You might also see these other spots here, and these are actually just um, areas of image artifacts. And for example, don't represent any cotton wool spots. Uh, the vessels appear to be normal, the macula itself looks to be normal, and the media is also quite clear. And this eye is the eye that had the vision loss with the transient gray curtains that eventually became black. The left eye was the one that had a weak history of a central gray blob. And indeed, when you look at the center of his eye, you see a geographic central area of what looks to be retinal ischemia. Conversely, you see that his optic nerve in the left eye is quite normal looking and quite healthy. The vessels here are also normal and the media is clear. And these spots again are the same image artifact spots and don't represent any, for example, quantum wool spots. And I was wondering if you thought that this looked familiar to anything I've shown you before. Take a look at these. Does that look like a white powdered donut and a red tart cherry to you? Right here and right here. Keep these motifs in mind as we move forward and I'll keep bringing these back. We got a visual field for this patient. And of course, in the right eye, the one with the white powdered donuts, it was completely black. And the left eye was getting to be there as well, unfortunately. When we did investigations in the emergency room, we see that his ESR was elevated at 87 and his CRP was elevated at 29. And of course, at this point in your mind as an ophthalmologist, you know what the top differential diagnosis is. And not only because this is a GCA round, but this is such a classic presentation, you have to be thinking about giant cell arteritis as your very top differential diagnosis. And of course, when you've made that presumptive diagnosis, you know what the plan is, and that is to start steroids. He was in the emergency room, so we decided to give him a gram of IV methylprednisolone in the eMERGE. And because it is still COVID times, we did not want to keep him in hospital, so we elected to discharge him with an outpatient script for prednisone um, oral prednisone and omeprazole to cover uh, for stomach protection. And in the same knee-jerk reflex we all have for starting steroids in presumptive giant cell arteritis, we know what the next step is, and that, of course, is to book a temporal artery biopsy. And this is where things get a little bit interesting. We decided to do a right temporal artery because this was the eye, you'll remember, with the white powder donut, the, the eye with the worst vision, and the eye with the RAPD. And this is what the pathology report was of the temporal artery biopsy that we did in clinic. The first thing you'll notice is that the clinical history, and this is what we put in ourselves, and you can see that we put in a lot of information and detail, and we told exactly to the pathologist what we were looking for, which was GCA. The second thing is that the gross description, which basically tells us how long the sample was that we took. And we did take a two centimeter length of temporal artery, which is actually uh, what in the literature, people say is an adequate amount to look for uh, giant cell arteritis to hopefully prevent looking for things uh, in the skip lesions that could be present in giant cell arteritis. But when you look at the pathology diagnosis, they actually say that there is no histologic evidence of giant cell arteritis. Hmm. Now, if your face looks like this emoji right now, again, that's okay. That's why we have these neuro ophthalmology grand rounds. And for my last grand round with Dr. Morgolan at May in the, I guess, the previous height of the pandemic, because I think we're living through the current height now, uh, I came up with some frequently asked questions that I thought other ophthalmologists and trainees might have when dealing with these neural ophthalmology cases. So I have two FAQs for you today, um, and I hope to impart on you some clinical pearls in these um, uh, FAQs. The first question I had was, what happens if I think it's GTA, but the biopsy is negative? And here's the poll that um, was brought up to you there. Would you want to look at the pathology slides yourself? Do you want to perhaps biopsy the same side again, looking for more tissue in the side with the worst vision? Do you want to bring it back to your clinic and to the minor's room to biopsy the other side? Or do you want to contact the pathologist to inquire for deeper cuts of the same biopsy? Perfect. Thank you, Michael. So I'm going to launch the results here. Ah, okay, so I see that uh, a lot of people decided to either biopsy the other side or contact the pathologist for deeper cuts of the same biopsy. Excellent, but I'm shocked that so few people decided to look at the pathology slides themselves because that is, of course, what we did. And I'm only kidding, no one here, I'm sure, has ever went to the pathologist <laughs> to look at the uh, temporal artery themselves. However, because again, neuro ophthalmology, I present to you here 
these slides of our patient's temporal artery. And by no means am I an expert pathology reader um, in any way whatsoever. And I'm sure there are faculty who are much more adept than I am, but I hope to give you a quick and dirty comprehensive ophthalmology guide to just understanding a little bit about the language about what pathologists look for when we're looking at these temporal arteries. If you've never seen this before, this is a low magnification um, uh, slide showing representative cross sections of the temporal artery uh, prepared with H and E. And with H and E, if you may remember from medical school, there are two colors that you look for, pink and blue. And it's very simple. These are the cross sections. So this is the lumen in the white and the pink is the vessel wall itself. And on gross examination, you see that there's actually not uh, that many areas of blue. It looks to be pretty good, just pink to me. And the blue, of course, represents staining of the nuclei of presumed uh, inflammatory cells. When you look at one of these uh, sections a bit closer, I've helpfully highlighted for you uh, some areas of blue. But these areas of blue represent something called marginated neutrophils, which can be normal when uh, found in um, as a result of processing or handling due to the temporal artery biopsy. So this is also within normal. The arrows here, I show these areas in the vessel walls, which just represent calcific sclerosis, which is on the spectrum of arterial sclerosis and is not significant. So there is actually no giant cells you see here and no significant amount of transmural inflammation that might give us some hints into a diagnosis of giant cell arteritis. So now let's actually do what a lot of you thought to do, which was to contact the pathologist for deeper cuts of the same biopsy. And if you didn't know, basically the initial specimen that you send, for example, if it's two centimeters, will be cut into four segments. And then those four segments are then further cut into 10 smaller segments. And then they're all examined. And if there's no evidence of giant cell arteritis, then they'll just call it and give the report that you saw previously. However, if you as the clinician decide to contact the pathologist, which you can do, it is possible to either email them or call them, they will respond. Um, and you ask for these deeper cuts of the biopsy, they will actually perform this for you. And this is what it might show. And again, this is the deeper cuts of our own patient's uh, temporal artery biopsy. And again, very easy to read pink and blue. We see that now in this blue box that there's actually some shades of blue. And if we zoom in and blow that up, we see here that across the entire vessel wall, there is transmural inflammation. There is presence of lymphocytes at all areas of the vessel wall, most heavily involved in the adventitia, but also in the intima and the media as well. So this, of course, is suggestive of a diagnosis of giant cell arteritis, and that is indeed what they write in this report. Now, most of you decided to biopsy the other side, and of course, this is also very reasonable, of course, and this is something that we also did to make sure that we conclusively had a diagnosis of giant cell arteritis. And this is the last slide of pathology I will show you, I promise, and I won't belabor the point anymore, but again, low magnification, H and D, as we zoom in, we see now that there is some areas of blue, and these here represent the macrophages um, that have infiltrated the vessel wall. And you can see the squiggly line here represents the internal elastic lamina. And this internal elastic lamina gets disrupted by this population of macrophages, another feature of giant cell arteritis. And at this point, you may be wondering, you know, Michael, where are these giant cells in giant cell arteritis? Isn't that where the diagnosis gets its name from? And yes, you are right, 80% of giant cell arteritis biopsies do have the uh, presence of giant cells, but it is not mandatory to make the diagnosis. Here in this one lonesome cell, they were able to find this one single small multinucleated giant cell. Um, and with all these features together, transmural inflammation, disruption of the internal elastic lamina, and this giant cell, they also confirmed that there was the diagnosis of giant cell arteritis. So now we've conclusively confirmed that our patient that we already knew all along had clinical uh, GCA. We were able to get the pathologist to also agree with us. And the whole point of going through this exercise is to tell you that a negative biopsy does not rule out GCA. And that is a very important point to realize is that GCA, even though we always think about doing the biopsy, the diagnosis is not made on pathology. It is supported by pathology, but the diagnosis itself is clinical. There is a really good article published in rheumatology titled, Why Do Temporal Arteries Go Wrong? And written by a very prolific pathologist and a um, rheumatologist at Harvard who studies giant cell arteritis. And in this paper, there was a quote that I thought was very poignant, and I'm going to read it to you now. 
It says that a mystic and dangerous assumption prevails in the mind of the clinician that the pathologist can produce a statement of absolute truth based on a small piece of tissue. And the corollary to the statement is that equally dangerous to mankind is the pathologist who thinks the same. And I, I thought this quote was very poignant because this came after a case that they presented in that paper, a very sad case. And this case was of a 77 year old man who presented to the eMERGE with acute vision loss, light perception in one eye, temporal headache, scalp tenderness, jaw claudication, elevated ESR and CRP, very classic symptoms for GCA. When the ophthalmologist took a look, they saw that the patient had actually bilateral optic nerve swelling. And they presumed that the diagnosis was GCA, started them on steroids. Of course, they also booked the temporal artery biopsy. And when they did, the, the surgeon who did the um, biopsy wasn't able to get two centimeters. They could only get 0 0.9 or 1.2 centimeters. And they did it bilaterally. And they also asked for deep cuts. And when they did that, they saw that there was no evidence for GCA. So the clinician who was taking care of this patient thought that, well, if the biopsies were negative on both sides, can't be GCA. So they stopped the steroids. And of course, you might guess that six weeks later, the other eye also became light perception once the steroids had been stopped. This patient became uh, severely depressed and unfortunately committed suicide after that. So it's very important for us to remember that the bottom line for this question is that if you think that the patient has GCA, but the biopsy is negative, you have to contact the pathologist to get deeper cuts of the same biopsy, or, and you have to biopsy the other side. And even if these two things come back negative, you still need to make that clinical diagnosis of GCA treat them appropriately, even without the histological uh, confirmation. And remember that if the pretest probability for GCA is so high, like in our patients, but the biopsy is negative, you really have to question the diagnosis. And again, my, my grand rounds presentation is not to suggest that you should be, you know, be able to read these pathology slides. I'm sure none of you ever will go and ask the pathologist, but you have to be able to have the same language of communication when you're talking to the pathologist. Similar to how when you're talking to the radiologist, you wanna be able to tell them where to look and what to look for. And remember that reading these pathology slides is not easy. And some pathologists think that you need to have giant cells to make the diagnosis, but you don't. As I've shown you, you can make the diagnosis with transmural inflammation or disruption of the internal elastic lamina. And remember that as the clinician, we really are the captain of the ship and we have to be taking care of the patient that's sitting in the chair in front of us, not taking care of their pathology results. So that was my first question I had. My second question I wanted to pose to you was how did this uh, patient lose vision from GCA? Let's take a look at this patient again. Now your gut told you that this patient had GCA, but how were you so sure? And I know this question looks a bit like an OCAP question, but try and look at it and I'm sure you'll be able to figure it out. Can we figure out which vascular distribution uh, this patient had and how they lost their vision? Uh, Michael, as the question is running, I know you're a local pathology expert. There is a question here from Trevor. I don't know if it's Trevor Chinfook or somebody else saying in light of the skip lesions, is there any value to longitudinal sections instead of the traditional cross sections here? Yes, I think for our case, we actually were able to get these longitudinal sections. I just didn't have the slides to show for the deeper cuts. And that also helped confirm uh, the diagnosis of GCA when we ask for deeper cuts. So yes, there definitely is value to that. But traditionally, pathologists look at cross-sections, from my understanding, as a not pathology expert. Okay, um, so the answers came back. And yes, most people did say that the short posterior ciliary arteries were involved in the right eye, and the left eye had the central retinal artery, which is correct. Michael? You could almost make an argument that when the case is this clear-cut clinically, that the biopsies don't even matter. You're right. I completely agree with you. GCA definitely is a clinical diagnosis, but I think we want to get the biopsies to just put it in everyone's mind that this patient does for sure have GCA. And because there's still a differential diagnosis, even in this case, of other vasculitides, we still want to be able to take a look at the pathology in these cases. But I absolutely agree with you, Dr. Lloyd, with such a clear-cut case the biopsy was only for confirmation. I'll quickly go over this, not to belabor the point here, but this white powder donut in the right eye definitely had an AAION from involvement of the short posterior ciliary arteries. And 80 to 90% of these cases of vision loss are actually from 
uh, involvement of these short posterior ciliary arteries. We don't know why that GCA loves to affect these vessels, but it is how patients mostly lose their vision. And this is the classic photo I'm sure we've all seen in our patients uh, who have GCA. In the left eye, as most of you correctly identified, the left eye had a CRAO, this red tart cherry or cherry red spot here in the middle. And this is of course due to inflammation and thrombosis of the central retinal artery. Taking a look quickly at the uh, uh, vascular supplies to the eye, and this is kind of uh, an allude to what Dr. Margolin was talking about for the rose, you see that the ophthalmic artery comes off the internal carotid artery over here. And two important branches that we talked about are the short posterior ciliary arteries, which perfuse the optic nerve head, and the central retinal artery, which dives into the optic nerve to perfuse the inner retina. A blow up here shows the same thing. So we have the ophthalmic artery coming here, this part was removed, but then the short posterior ciliary artery perfused the optic nerve head through the circle of Zinhaler. And then you also have the central retinal artery that perfuses the inner retina. And that is how our patient lost their vision. And the important point for this question is that you knew intuitively this was GCA. And the more striking feature about this is that these are actually two different vascular supplies for the eye. We have the short posterior ciliary arteries and we have the central retinal artery. And these are two different vascular supplies. And when you are seeing in one patient two different vascular supplies that are affected, the diagnosis is almost certainly something vasculitic in nature and is almost impossible to really be anything else. So thank you for your attention. Uh, the bottom line for my entire presentation is this, and I hope you take away these clinical pearls. The first thing is that interpreting pathology for GCA is challenging and not as easy as looking for giant cells and you need to communicate with your pathologist exactly what you're looking for, especially when it comes back negative. And when you're in doubt, you really should be doing those deeper cuts and or asking for a biopsy of the other side. Remember, as a lot of you have pointed out, that GCA is a clinical diagnosis and you do not need to have pathology to confirm your diagnosis, unlike in malignancy or oncology, where you really do need to have that tissue confirmation to stage the patient. This entity of GCA does not require that, and it is a clinical diagnosis. The last point I want to impart on you is that vision loss from GCA is most often due to involvement of the short posterior ciliary arteries, which cause an AAION. And in 10% of the time, you can also get a CRAO. And if you ever see both in the same patients, like in my patient here, you need to think and remember that it is GCA until proven otherwise, no matter what the biopsy says. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. This was excellent. And again, we wanted to highlight that this case highlights the butt of the rose, the short posterior ciliary arteries, as well as the stem of the rose, the central retinal arteries, two most common causes of visual loss from giant cell arteritis. So uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Sima Nami, who will present another case of giant cell arteritis to you. Michael, thank you. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Um, my name's Seema. I'm one of the PGY3 residents, and I'm really excited to be speaking with you today with this excellent group to tell you the story of the second blind man in our series, uh, or otherwise a tale of vasculitis, small, large, and everything in between. So our story begins, as almost all of these cases do, in the emergency department, where we meet our patient, a 60-year-old man who's healthy on no medications of Eritrean Canadian descent. He comes in complaining of one month of a new left-sided headache that his family doctor has been managing as a, as a case of presumed sinusitis. He's had two courses of antibiotics, and there's been some transient improvement, but it hasn't quite gone away. He came to the emergency department today because he's discovered new blurred vision in his right eye. So he gets referred to ophthalmology, where we find that his uncorrected vision is 20-20 in both eyes, but there is a mild right-sided RAPD. The anterior segment is normal in both eyes, and dilated fundus exam reveals the following. The most striking finding is that in the right eye, there is a pink elevated nerve with more pronounced disc swelling along the uh, superior segment of the optic nerve. And you can actually see here uh, that the optic nerve almost looks like it's divided in two with uh, an area, and I'll show with my pointer here, of uh, swelling along the superior aspect, whereas the inferior aspect of the optic nerve looks much flatter. Uh, there are some peripapillary cotton wool spots as well. <clears throat> 
which you can kind of perceive here. In the fellow eye, in the left eye, the optic nerve looks pink, flat, and healthy, and there is some moderate cupping. There were no peripheral changes or macular changes in either eye. OCT of the peripapillary RNFL confirmed mild disc swelling in the right, and visual fields showed an inferior altitudinal visual field defect in the right eye, and some nonspecific peripheral changes in the left eye. So it appears that we're faced with a patient with a unilateral right-sided optic neuropathy. And as we all know, this carries a wide differential diagnosis. To narrow this down, we can think of our patient as having a unilateral segmental optic neuropathy in the right eye. And when faced with a patient who's over the age of 50, uh, presenting with intact visual acuity, we often think of non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. This is one of the most common neuroophthalmic causes of vision loss that we see, and it certainly fits the demographic of our patient. However, some important things to remember in this case, he does not have a disc at risk. Um, and as we'll discuss later, any patient who presents with a swollen unilateral nerve deserves some further questioning. So on further review, we actually do find that in addition to these new headaches and the blurred vision, he's developed some recent pain with chewing and he's quite a stoic guy. So he doesn't notice all of these things or bring them up right away. He's also had some general non-specific fatigue and his clothes have been fitting a little bit lo looser than usual. So a knee-jerk response in this case is to order some investigatory blood work. This shows that his ESR is highly elevated at 128 millimeters an hour. And the CRP is also elevated and there is a relative thrombocytosis compared to his previous blood work. So in summary, our patient is a 60 year old black man who's presenting with headache, jaw glottication, fatigue and weight loss with new field loss in the right eye. His, elevate, his inflammatory markers are elevated and there are signs of an ischemic optic neuropathy. So I'm gonna pose a question to the audience to see what would you do next? And I'll give everyone a couple minutes to respond. The first choice is to start steroids. The second is to obtain neuroimaging with an MRI. And the third is to perform a temporal artery biopsy. Or if you can't choose, you can select all of the above. And maybe we'll just give everyone a couple of moments there. All right, so I'll end the poll there. All right, Almost so we've got a little bit of a split. <laughs> Um, so uh, most people would uh, say to either start steroids right away or to go for all three. And we chose the latter. Um, I think as Michael has shown, uh, discussed in the previous talk, anytime that you have a clinical suspicion of giant cell arteritis, it's important to start steroids right away. And I'm glad that so almost everybody recognized this. Um, we know that time is vision in giant cell arteritis and delaying treatment can lead to not only worse vision loss in the affected eye, but also loss of vision in the fellow eye. As we also discussed, a temporal artery biopsy is a necessary step when you're uh, concerned about giant cell arteritis for confirming the diagnosis. However, in this case, uh, given some of the atypical features, we felt that it was important to also pursue an MRI of the brain and orbits with gadolinium. And we'll discuss this a little bit further. Why did we think this was atypical and we needed an MRI? Well, first of all, this patient's relatively young. He's 60 years old. And although we think about giant cell arteritis in patients who are over the age of 50, I'm sure that most of us can agree from our clinical practice that usually this is seen in patients who are over the age of 70. Moreover, he's of African descent. And numerous studies have shown that, this is, that giant cell arteritis is a disease that typically affects patients of Caucasian uh, background. Moreover, his vision is 20-20 and his optic nerve is pink. Um, giant cell arteritis, as Michael also showed, um, often presents with catastrophic vision loss um, and is highly associated with a chalky nerve. So we did obtain the imaging. And as you can see here on the coronal slices on the right-hand side, as we're on the left-hand side, uh, there is thickening and enhancement of the perineural um, optic nerve sheath tissue here with sparing of the central axons. And if we compare that, this is bilateral. And when we compare it to the, to the axial slices on the left, you can see that this enhancement extends longitudinally from the globe all the way back to the apex. It's a little bit difficult to see here because of the slices, but it was very symmetric on either side. So putting this together, our patient is presenting clinically with a right anterior optic neuropathy, but radiographically, he also shows signs of a bilateral perineuritis. How can this be? 
So the anterior optic neuropathy stems from involvement of the short posterior ciliary arteries. And as we've discussed, these small vessels branch from the ophthalmic artery and pierce the sclera to perfuse the optic nerve head. Almost all of the time in giant cell arteritis, all of these vessels are, infected, are affected, causing uh, catastrophic vision loss and a pale nerve with severe swelling. Very rarely, as in our case, these vessels, which form two semicircular um, uh, insertions around the optic nerve, can become involved segmentally. And this is a pattern that we typically see in NAION. When this happens, when only one segment is involved, um, we can have this segmental disc swelling with a relatively pink optic nerve. And again, here you can see that these short posterior ciliary arteries perfuse, uh, sorry, pierce the sclera and perfuse the optic nerve head, forming the circle of Zinhaller. The perineuritis, however, stems from vasculitis of this microscopic small um, anastomotic network, which perfuses the optic nerve sheath, uh, known as the vasa nervosum. And when this, these tracts here become inflamed, this is how we come to see this longitudinal enhancement along the optic nerve sheath here. Perineuritis is a small vessel disease and it does carry with it a rather specific uh, differential diagnosis listed here. But when you're faced with two causes of um, vascular inflammation, namely here the perineuritis and the involvement of the short posterior ciliary arteries, you have to think of a disease that connects both of them. In this case, vasculitis, most likely giant cell arteritis, is the culprit that would explain both. But as we've discussed, this is a patient who we would think is relatively atypical for giant cell arteritis. So we started to wonder, is there another vasculitic entity that could explain his presentation better? So we undertook some further imaging, a CT angi angiogram of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis, which showed extensive extracranial large vessel disease. As you can see here, there is significant narrowing and stenosis of the thoracic aorta, of the abdominal aorta. There's involvement of the renal arteries as shown here, as well as the common iliac arteries. And if you can see here, down here in the bottom right, uh, along the aorta, there's actually almost circumferential um, thickening of the wall, causing uh, reflecting the vasculitis occurring elsewhere in his body. So there is another vasculitic entity that is more often seen in younger patients who are non-Caucasian, and this is Takayatsu arteritis. Takayatsu arteritis is typically diagnosed in patients who are under the age of 40, although there is a category that is known as late onset Takayatsu, uh, which is seen in patients up to the age of 60 or 65. And it is much more predominantly a large vessel disease causing okay. loss of pulses in the extremities. There are many people who have, uh, who have uh, suggested that giant cell arteritis and Takayatsu may actually be phenotypes along the same, different phenotypes along the same spectrum of disease. So we wondered, is there a way that we can um, definitively differentiate the, this patient's presentation to tell us directly, is this giant cell or is this Takayatsu? Because this can have implications for management um, and potential for complications. So we turned to our pathology colleagues who looked at the temporal artery biopsy that we had uh, submitted as soon as we were suspicious of giant cell arteritis. The biopsy did show evidence of active granulomatous inflammation with disruption of the internal elastic lamina and transmural inflammation. And we asked them, can you tell us which type of vasculitis this is? This was a really interesting point for us because as the ophthalmology team, as well as the pathology team, we learned through this case that there is actually no pathologic way to differentiate Takayatsu arteritis from giant cell arteritis. Um, and again, this was a really um, high yield case because the pathologist actually went back to the textbooks and we looked through the literature, but there are very, very few ways to differentiate this, um, making it much more of a clinical interdisciplinary diagnosis. Coming back to our patient in front of us though, uh, we wondered how does this patient lose vision? So again, the short posterior ciliary arteries are the culprit here. They've become involved by the vasculitis in a segmental fashion, causing an altitudinal field defect um, and a pink nerve, but sparing the central acuity because only some of these short posterior ciliary arteries were involved. So what does this mean for the general ophthalmologist and what can you learn from this case? Well, the first uh, take home point is that every patient who's presenting with a clinical picture of an anterior ischemic optic neuropathy over the age of 50 must be screened for giant cell arteritis. 
So this means asking questions about scalp tenderness, jaw claudication, constitutional symptoms, and new headache, and sending patients for screening inflammatory markers. Remember that when, although the most typical presentation is a, uh, is a circumferential swollen pale nerve, there is potential for these nerves to be involved, for these um, arteries to be involved in a segmental fashion, causing a mimic of NAION. As well, this case really showed us that, there, that GCA can be a complicated disease with many subtleties. Our patient had extensive extracranial disease with complete absence of any symptoms beyond his headache and vision loss. So that shows us that it's not that investigations are not necessarily just limited to the inflammatory markers and the temporal artery biopsy. Some studies have suggested that if you pursue the correct imaging, you'll find signs of aortitis in up to two thirds of patients. And this is very clinically relevant because this can lead to death from aortic dissection as well as significant morbidity. And it's a point of contention in the neuroophthalmology community about whether we should be doing routine imaging of the aorta in all patients who have suspected giant cell arteritis. So if you're faced with a patient you're concerned for GCA, make sure you reach out to your neuro-ophthalmology colleagues early so they can help navigate uh, this decision making. And third, we learned from this case that vasculitis is a spectrum and that patients who you may consider to be atypical may actually pre be presenting with a different uh, phenotype of a worrisome vasculitic disease. So if you're faced with a patient who has signs of a small, medium, and large vessel vasculitis or a panvasculitis, do consider tachyapsus. Do bring it up to your rheumatology colleagues because this can have implications for the complications this patient may face, as well as uh, implications for the type of immunomodulatory therapy that they may choose down the road. And with that, I just want to say thank you for your attention. And um, if there are any questions, we can take them in the chat box or at the end. Thank you, Seema. That was excellent. So Seema's case, again, presented with a case of um, a man who had really had panvasculitis, small vessel disease involving the small peel arteries supplying the optic nerve posteriorly, as well as short posterior ciliary arteries, which is a medium sized vessel, as well as the large vessels, such as all these multiple aortic branches. And she also discussed with you briefly the, um, the differential diagnosis for perineuritis, which we commonly see in giant cell arteritis is on top of the list there, as well as sarcoid and mock disease. But here, taking everything together, patient with elevated inflammatory markers, constitutional symptoms, and involvement of two separate uh, vasculatures, vasculitis was on top of our list. Um, thank you so much, Seema, and we will maybe we'll get back to you if we have time at the end. And then I would like to present to you Laura Donaldson, who is our current neuro Fellow Laura has finished um, an MD, PhD degree at the University of Toronto. And then she went on to complete an ophthalmology residency at McMaster, which she has recently completed and she has joined our program um, just a couple of months ago. Welcome, Laura. She's going to present to you a case of a third blind man. Okay, thanks very much, Dr. Margolin. Thanks for inviting me to speak. So I'm going to talk about the third blind man where he sees nothing and we don't either. So this is an elderly gentleman, a 92 year old man who was feeling a little bit unwell and then six days later developed sudden vision loss in both eyes. There were no headaches, scalp tenderness or jaw claudication. In his medical history, as you had expected age of 92, he had a few medical issues, some vascular risk factors and was taking multiple medications. On exam, vision was 2060 and no light perception with a dense left RAPD. His fundus examination was completely normal. Fortunately, I don't have photos, but you can see in the OCT, there's certainly no swelling of the optic nerve, unable to do the visual field in the left as he has no perception of light and extensive visual field changes in the other eye that was 2060. So we can do our first poll and ask, what do you think is going on? Okay, so very good. Everyone is right on the ball with this one. So 
He's certainly not malingering. You can't fake pupils and he has a relative afferent pupillary defect. Maculopathy usually um, does not result in this profound of a vision loss and usually does not cause the relative afferent pupillary defect. You could think about a stroke, but the central vision is usually really not affected in a unilateral lesion. And so this is a retrobulbar optic neuropathy. There is a differential for unilateral vision loss with a normal exam. In a younger patient, you might be thinking about demyelinating retrobulbar optic neuritis. You can have an ac acute compressive optic neuropathy, infiltrative optic neuropathy. Some infectious causes may initially look pretty normal on exam traumatic optic neuropathy in the correct context, posterior ischemic optic neuropathy, and rarely Lieber's hereditary optic neuropathy if you're catching them when the first eye is involved and the second is not yet involved. In terms of things that can cause vision loss with a normal exam that don't have a relative afferent pupillary defect, the list is very small. Uh, you're thinking about an occult maculopathy or outer retinopathy, something perhaps like acute macular neuroretinopathy or PAM. Bilateral occipital lobe strokes can cause severe vision loss with the normal fundus. And then you always need to think about in this context of a malingering patient or perhaps someone with a functional vision loss. In our patient on his exam, we noted that his temporal arteries were quite prominent and indurated and his inflammatory markers were highly elevated with a slight thrombocytosis. So we can do the second poll of what would you do next? So as this poll is going on, there has been a previous question in the chat about Dopplers for temporal arteries. And perhaps we can touch on that either um, now or towards the end of the presentation, but I'm just gonna end this poll here. Okay, good. So most people are going with the temporal artery biopsy. And so that is the correct answer here. It still remains the gold standard for a diagnosis of GCA. And of course, you never wait for the biopsy to start your steroids. You're going to start them immediately. IVFA can be helpful. You can see the abnormalities in the choroidal perfusion, which is highly suggestive of GCA. Temporary ultrasound can be a good test. It's non-invasive, um, but you need quite an experienced operator and it's not available everywhere. You look for a halo sign on the artery. CT head in this case is not useful. You could consider an MRI of the brain in orbits if the inflammatory markers were normal, he didn't have this systemic picture and you were thinking about some of those other things that I mentioned on the list of causes of unilateral vision loss with a normal exam. In this man, our pretest probability of GCA is extremely high. He's got very high inflammatory markers. He has systemic symptoms, although you know not all of the classic GCA symptoms, he certainly was feeling unwell with fever. So this is very likely posterior ischemic optic neuropathy with this presentation. And really we're thinking almost 100% this is GCA. How does one go blind from GCA? So we've seen three cases today, all with permanent vision loss related to ocular ischemia. And this happens in about 10% of patients with GCA. By far the most common cause is arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, central retinal artery and ciliary retinal artery are other important causes of vision loss in this case. And posterior ischemic optic neuropathy as in the current case is actually quite uncommon. We've talked a little bit about this already. What is the blood supply of the optic nerves? The optic nerve um, has multiple different components and multiple different blood supplies. So within the eye, the retinal nerve fiber layer is supplied by the central retinal artery. The prelaminar optic nerve, or the, um, where you see the optic nerve head, is supplied by the short posterior ciliary arteries. And right at the lamina cabrosa, you have the circle of Zinn Haller and the short, short posterior ciliary arteries. When you move back to the intraorbital portion behind the globe, most anteriorly, there is a little bit of contribution here from your short posterior ciliary arteries. You have the central retinal artery, which will come in and enter the nerve about a centimeter back from the globe. And that's gonna give off branches that will supply the optic nerve from the center. From the outside, you have the peel vessels, 
that are supplying kind of circumferentially. And as you move, oh, sorry, as you move further back, when you have the ophthalmic artery running here, that'll give off a lot of important branches and you have this peel network continuing along the outside. When you get to the bony optic canal, it's really the ophthalmic artery is almost the sole blood supply. And then as you enter the intracranial segment, there are multiple supplies from the anterior intracranial circulation, like the anterior superficial, sorry, anterior superior hypophyseal artery, anterior cerebral, anterior communicating, and uh, the ophthalmic artery at its origin. So why don't we see more posterior ischemic optic neuropathy? Well, versus the anterior form, it's quite uncommon because with anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, that circulation of the short posterior art short posterior ciliary arteries is really an end arterial system, which makes it a watershed zone vulnerable to ischemic damage. In the non-arteritic form, especially, there's also an anatomic predisposition to develop um, AION. You have a disc at risk where you, as soon as you get a little bit of ischemia and the axons start to swell as they're damaged, this creates a compartment syndrome and leads to further damage. Disc drusen are thought to perhaps contribute to this crowded compartment in some cases as well. Whereas with posterior ischemic optic neuropathy, you have mostly the supply from the peel vasculature, which has multiple collateral sources as we talked about. So much less vulnerable due to this collateral circulation. And there are also no known anatomic or structural risk factors that will predispose you to posterior ischemic optic neuropathy. This really remains a diagnosis of exclusion. You have to ensure that their fundus exam is otherwise normal and make sure that there's nothing else in that list I talked about earlier that could be contributing. There are essentially two subtypes of this with a potential third controversial subtype. So the first is arteritic related to GCA as we see in this case. And the second common cause of this posterior ischemia is related usually in the perioperative setting to uh, profound hypotension. The most common surgical setting in which you see this is in spinal surgeries, which often have prolonged prone positioning, which can give you orbital congestion. Any surgery where you have a lot of uh, hypotension in the perioperative time can also give this picture. Anemia, as well as use of vasopressors in the interoperative setting can contribute as well because they can lead to vasoconstriction of all those small peel branches. Overall though, this is quite uncommon. When you're talking about spinal surgery, which is the most common setting to see this, it's still only estimated at about 0.087% of all spinal surgeries. When posterior ischemic optic neuropathy was originally described by Hayray, he described a significant non-arteritic population with this, but this is quite controversial now. We think that really the majority of cases are either arteritic or related to hypotension. So in non-surgical PION, when you have a consideration of this diagnosis, a patient with profound vision loss and an RAPD, it's really GCA until you prove otherwise. As we talked about, they will have a normal examination initially, but if you continue, continue to follow these patients, you will see them developing optic atrophy and pallor about six to eight weeks after the event. The vision loss in PION is usually very severe. In over 50% of cases, it's counting fingers or worse. And it's also very often bilateral, especially if you're talking about these cases related to surgery and hypotension, it's over 50%. You can confirm this diagnosis if you have appropriate imaging studies. So the same way to look for ischemia when you're looking for a stroke is the principle applied to looking for PION. So you look for a diffusion restriction, so areas that are bright on DWI, a couple of cases here that show that, and dark on your ADC or associated diffusion coefficient. It can be hard to pick this up because the optic nerves are quite small and there is this artifact from surrounding structures and there are volume averaging effects as well. So if you are looking for this, you must ask for thin orbital cuts. You should look in the coronal plane. As you can see, this is a coronal section here. This is the T2, you do see a bright T2 signal as well. And you can also ask for something called a diffusion tensor imaging sequence or a DTI, which also uses diffusion coefficients, but takes advantage of the fact that diffusion along a 
bundle of fibers is greater when it's parallel to that fiber bundle compared to when it's perpendicular. So it has a good view of the diffusion along the optic nerve. So just to summarize, there are two main mechanisms of posterior ischemic optic neuropathy. Either it's profound hypotension, often in a surgical setting, or a small vessel arteritis affecting the peel vessels. And sudden vision loss in an older patient with a normal exam and an RAPD is GCA until proven otherwise. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Uh, for the last case where we wanted you to think of the air surrounding the rose producing the visual loss. So I'll just uh, do, we'll just regroup based on, uh, go back to our initial introduction, uh, just to put it all together again. The purpose of the rounds was for us to present three cases, um, three most common causes of visual loss from giant cell arthritis. So let's think back about the rose. Just as the rose most commonly wilts away at its bud, the most common cause of visual loss in patients with giant cell arthritis occurs in the optic nerve head, but the involvement of these short posterior, posterior ciliary arteries by the vasculitic process. And the result of that is typically a massive infarct of the optic nerve head with the swollen and the pale optic nerve head as Michael's shown you in his case. Sometimes though, not all short posterior ciliary arteries are involved and optic nerve head swelling is not pallid and can even be segmental, thus resembling NION as Seema presented to you in her second case. So sometimes you can only get one branch of the short posterior ciliary artery, ciliary artery involved. And you can see patients with ciliary retinal artery occlusion. Ciliary retinal artery is a branch of ciliary circulation as well. And uh, for some reasons, giant ciliary arteries has predisposition for affecting, affecting the branches of the ciliary arteries. So it affects short posterior ciliary arteries producing either a massive infarct of the optic nerve head or rarely affect some of the short posterior ciliary arteries that supply the optic nerve head. Thus, we should be screening everybody with NION for giant ciliary arteritis. Occasionally, it can involve long, long ciliary arteries um, and those supply the anterior segment and extraocular muscles. And that's presumed to be the reason for transient diplopia in um, some patients with giant ciliary arteritis. And occasionally it can involve um, only one branch of the short posterior ciliary arteries, which is a ciliary retinal artery. So that's the bud. Um, now, thinking back about the stem, the second most common cause of visual loss in GCA, which happens about 10 to 20% of patients, is involvement of the stem, which is the central retinal artery. Thus, anybody with a central retinal artery occlusion and no visible embolus in the exam you should be thinking of giant cell arteritis until proven otherwise. And then lastly, think about the air around the rose. The rarest cause of visual loss in giant cell arteritis happening in approximately 5% of patients or less is this posterior ischemic optic neuropathy from the involvement of the small peel branches supplying the posterior portion of the optic nerve. So uh, then again, this is think of it as the air around the rose being very, very poor and, and the rose wilting away from that. So anyone again with a presumed diagnosis of posterior ischemic optic neuropathy should be thought of having giant arteritis until proven otherwise. And then remember that when the rose dies from more than one cause, when there's a problem with both the butt and the stem, uh, when there's a involvement of short posterior ciliary arteries as well as the central retinal artery or when you see somebody with a central retinal artery occlusion and ciliary retinal artery occlusion, so here you get involvement of two separate circulations of the eye, and then the diagnosis here is almost exclusively going to be vasculitis until proven otherwise. And the vasculitis that involves these circulations are almost exclusively giant cell arteritis. So in conclusion, I encourage you to practice mindfulness when seeing patients with difficult or unusual presentations as practicing mindfulness will create an environment where making an accurate diagnosis is easier. And we're hoping that understanding these three most common mechanisms of visual loss in patients with giant cell arthritis should help trigger your mind to recognize these scenarios when you encounter them in your patients. Thank you everybody for joining us. We have uh, just a few minutes left for questions. And right, uh, we've got a couple of questions here for yeah. you or the panel. Uh, so feel free to anyone else to chime in yeah. as well. First of all, great talks. GCA scares the rest of us uh, a lot. So there's some really, really good questions about managing 
um, these patients. How often do you see someone develop second eye vision loss while they're on treatment? And so this, uh, this is more the acute question. And then there's a similar question which asks um, about relapse, maybe during the taper or, or one to two years later when someone's off steroids altogether. Uh, so I don't know if you wanna address that. Okay, so let's do the first question. Um, this was asked by Dr. Easterbrook. He asked us how often does the patient go on to lose the second eye while on steroids? Actually, I was pondering the same question and I have actually was thinking about that. The literature says that that can really only happen in the first week, in the first six days, really. And the number is small. Different studies sort of cite different numbers, but it's anywhere from one to maybe 6%, somewhere there. But most people agree that it's very small, maybe around 2 to 3%. Anyway, it's very rare. It's uncommon. Uh, but certainly we have all, I've certainly seen it more than once. Uh, the second question was, in patients with giant cellular duritis who are started on steroids, what is the risk of future blindness related to vasculitis after finishing a course of treatment? Are you treated for one to two years? Okay, so, uh, okay, this is also an excellent question. Um, just a general answer. We know that giant cell arteritis is generally um, a disease that kind of burns itself out. It's sort of, sort of an acute disease that lasts anywhere from six months to about a year. Um, and some of this information we learned from uh, before the steroids were available. Um, there's an article that I've shared with many of our previous trainees from Annals of Internal Medicine from somewhere in the 40s, where they presented a bunch of cases of giant cell arteritis. And really, in all of these cases, the disease kind of burned itself out within about a year. Um, there are some cases where case reports where it can, can recur uh, and can relapse after a year, but really very, very, very rare. Um, and uh, the question was, can it happen? Well, the, the risk of losing vision after the initial period is really is pretty much approaching zero. I would have to have yet to see the case. I, it's really close to zero. I'm sure you can find something in the literature, but you have to examine it closely to make sure it's really a valid case. So um, uh, there's another question in that, which is great too, is do you recommend a minimum duration of steroid treatment for all GCA? Well, difficult to answer that. We would, usually we would say that six months, two years, probably the minimum, a minimal amount. I think that's pretty accurate answer. Six months to a year. And then Nancy Epstein asked us, can you have CREO with ciliary retinal artery sparing? Yes, of course, Nancy. Um, that can definitely happen. It happens most of the time. Um, central, well, not more, it can happen. Central retinal artery um, is... Uh, comes off of ophthalmic artery um, much further back um, and short posterior ciliary arteries. And remember, ciliary retinal arteries is also a branch of the short posterior ciliary circulation. Comes off really much uh, further down. And uh, so these are two separate circulations. So you can definitely have sparing of the ciliary retinal arteries with, uh, with involvement of the central retinal artery. Um, Ed, do you mind if I just uh, just could make one comment? I think yeah. those cases were all great today, and it just emphasizes the importance of uh, looking at the pathology carefully. We recently had a case where the pathologist's impression was no negative for vasculitis, but then when you read his impression, he described the classic GCA um, description. So they just made a mistake when they put their impression in. Um, just for the the last case where you have um, you know NLP. Uh, suddenly with the normal exam, I would probably get an MRI too in that case because you really can't be sure what's going on behind the eye, especially if there are systemic symptoms. So you sometimes you can see, you know, uh, internal carotid artery aneurysm can expand pretty quickly or you can have infiltrative disease. Um, and sometimes even fungal disease from the sinus can invade. So I think it's also important to get an MRI. And some people would argue you might need to get an MRI in every case of GCA to wear out these uh, rule out these rare causes, but I think definitely if the eye exam is normal, it would be a good idea to get an MRI, even if the ESR and CRP are normal. Yes, I remember you presented us a case, uh, uh, you showed me the case of a mucus seal. Uh, now, this case was kind of clinched. We did not proceed with neuroimaging in this man uh, because his inflammatory markers were very, very high, and uh, he had a bunch of very, very classic systemic symptoms. So yeah, good, good point. Well, 
Before we wind it up, can I just ask, Seema, you raised a very intriguing point that I had never thought of before about imaging other blood vessels, including the aorta, for some of these cases. And I confess, I didn't quite get the take-home point as to when you might go down that pathway. So, um, John, um, that is really an excellent question. It's sort of debatable uh, because really the treatment for involvement of other arteries will be the same, will be a uh, high dose of steroids, which should treat you of uh, the involvement of, of the aorta as well. So treatment for irrititis from giant cell arteries will be the same, uh, which is immunosuppression of steroids. However, we did have a case um, that <laughs> happened to us several years ago, and Jonathan might remember it. Uh, this was an elder lady who had a fairly classic presentation for giant cell arteritis. Uh, even though her biopsy was negative, we kept her on steroids for a while. Um, and then we eventually did wean her off the steroids. And then she presented with a moment of the other eye. Um, and so this was an exception to the rule, very, very rare. And again, we admitted her to the hospital, started workup. Um, her second temporary biopsy was negative, but uh, she was complaining of shortness of breath and we did a chest X-ray and she had a very, to make a long story short, a very long aortic dissection of, uh, which was actually inoperable. And so she died of that. So that, uh, it, while in a hospital. Uh, so that really made an impression on me to really remember about um, imaging the chest wall and I've discussed it with people. So um, again, what would you do? Keep her in steroids and definitely probably not a great option as well. But yes, some people do image uh, large vessels and everybody was giant cell arteritis. Again, the utility of that is somewhat questionable because the, the treatment is usually the same. You, maybe the duration of immunosuppression would be different longer with that, but yes. Well, so, and also sometimes it's the only way to make the diagnosis. We recently had a case of a patient with a six nerve palsy who um, uh, he also developed tongue claudication and we did bilateral temporal artery biopsies that are both negative. Um, and the only way to see the disease was actually on the MRA of his chest where you could see the aortitis. Mm -hmm. So that, that man could have had that sort of variant of like, which is mostly involved in the large vessel, like the Takayasu's type of variant, which can be difficult to diagnose with uh, on temporal artery biopsy sometimes. So yeah. that's also a good point. So uh, certainly some people do it routinely. After I've seen that, after I had that case, I've uh, started imaging everybody routinely that kind of, then I kind of, Went away from that pattern. So yeah, well, that's that's really um, an important thing to remember. Okay, somebody asked a question of blindness. Is, I think we have we don't have any time, but the very last question. In the patient's polymyalgia rheumatica history and CRO, but with signs of carotid circulation occlusion, would you recommend temporal artery biopsy? Have you seen concomitant presentation? So let's say PM, PMR, CRO with signs of carotid circulation occlusion. Okay, I'm not sure I'm totally understanding the question, but yes, if you see CREO and there, there are systemic uh, symptoms, um, this patient definitely deserves uh, the workup for giant cell arteritis and steroids while the workup is undergoing. Um, I think, I think carotid occlusion, complete carotid occlusion can rarely mimic GCA. So you can get a severe ischemic optic neuropathy from, uh, from that, it's hemodynamic and you can sometimes get uh, carotid, sorry, a uh, choroidal non-perfusion and jaw claudication. So that is a rare mimicker of GCA, like caro a complete carotid. You mean the mimicker? So I, okay, so the question was if there's a carotid artery occlusion in CREO, it's secondary to that. Okay. Um, um, and then the last, typically carotid artery occlusion happens over time and there's typically collateral vessels. So it's not common to get CREO with that, although you can get the emboli. If blindness is very rare after six months to 12 months, the main thing we want to avoid, and we often deal with major steroid sign of complications, should there be more research on into one year of steroids or the minimum to avoid blindness? Then taper up and possibly trial are there steroid agents? Well, yes, that is exactly kind of the standard of care. Typically, the, uh, the uh, steroids are tapered after, after six months to a year. That is the standard of care. And then typically, these patients would typically give them um, over to rheumatologists to manage after approximately six months to a year uh, because uh, the, the risk of visual loss is very, very, very low after that amount of time. Uh, I think we really ran out of time. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us.
<clears throat> Great job, everyone. Great cases. Thanks again, Ed and team. Really, really entertaining round, generating lots of excellent discussion. Thank you, everybody, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thanks. Great rounds. Oh, Ed. <clears throat>